Hey guys, happy Thursday. Kevin Cruz here with another Throwback Thursday episode, this time with the legendary Hiram Smith. If you don't know the name, I mean, he was the original creator of the Franklin Day Planner, co-founder of the Franklin Quest Company. Today, it's known as Franklin Covey Company. I mean, he's like the godfather of so much of the early professional development industry and just so uh, so wise and has made an impact on so many lives. Um, really, one of the bigger honors I've had interviewing guests was this one with Hiram Smith. Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. What are the three gaps that separate you from where you are today and where you want to be? Hello everyone, Kevin Cruz here, helping you to achieve your full potential five days a week. And in just a minute, we're going to talk about how to make a real difference. But first, don't forget to visit leadx.org. You'll find hundreds of articles from great business and career writers and sign up for our quick read newsletter, which is packed with actionable tips to help you to fulfill your potential. Our guest today is a true legend in the professional development space. He was one of the original creators of the popular Franklin Day Planner, co-founded the Franklin Quest Company, which became the Franklin Covey Company, he has three honorary degrees, and he's been inducted into the Utah Business Hall of Fame. He is a best-selling author and known for his high-impact speeches. In fact, in the immediate weeks after 9-11, Rudy Giuliani called our guest and Stephen Covey to come to Ground Zero to address the families of all those who had been directly affected by the tragedy. His latest book is The Three Gaps, Are You Making a Difference?, our guest, of course, is Hiram Smith. Hiram, thank you for your contributions and welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, sir. I'm very glad and excited to be here. Appreciate your inviting me. Well, we're going to talk about your book in just a minute. But first, I'm hoping you can share with our listeners a time when you failed, maybe early in your career, and what was a lesson that you learned from it? Well, it's sad we only have uh, a short time because I had all kinds of failure <laughs> in my early career. <laughs> uh, you know, but one one that really stands out. I uh, a friend of mine came to me when I was just getting out of the army, and he had this great uh, business investment idea, and we were going to make millions of dollars. and And I got excited about it. Didn't do my homework, and I borrowed a bunch of money, invested in it. It was a train wreck financially. And, uh, you know, I, I, I look back on it now, and I'm not sure how I survived it then, but uh, I look back on it now, and, the, you know, the lesson I learned from that is you better do your homework. You know, it's easy to get excited about something, but you better do your homework before you decide to invest in anything, whether it's investing your time or your, your capital or whatever. Do your homework. <laughs> and I didn't do my homework. Boy, I wish I had learned that lesson uh, from you years ago, because as I look back, Hiram, my biggest financial losses have always been I was most excited by the idea. And I was so excited. <laughs> I didn't do that homework. I didn't do the due diligence. And it turns out that the uh, the market wasn't as excited about my ideas as I was. <laughs> yeah. Hiram, you say that if we close the gaps in three areas of our life, beliefs, values, and time, we will live a more balanced, productive life and make a bigger difference. So let's start and talk about the beliefs gap and, and what you call the belief window. What is that? There's a question that each we have to ask that deals with each of the gaps. And the question that we have to ask with the belief gap is, is there a gap between what I believe is true and what is actually true. And if there is a gap between that, then I, I've got, I'm, I'm gonna be in some pain. For example, suppose I believe that gravity only works in the morning. That may be a problem for me in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the issue is, is my belief system lined up with reality? And we've discovered and created a, a, a simple blueprint that we talk about in the book on how to 
identify and understand what our belief system is. And the belief window is a simple idea that we have in front of us hanging from a little wire that comes from the back of our head, taps on a window, and this window hangs right in front of our face. We call it the belief window. And we look out through this window. We accept information from the world through this window. And on that window, we have placed our beliefs and the principles that we believe are true. Now, whether those principles and beliefs are true or not is a whole different matter, but we happen to believe they're true. So for example, suppose I believe that my self-worth is dependent on my possessions. So if I believe that's true, what will I spend my life doing? I'm gonna spend my life acquiring stuff. And you know, you see a lot of people who have a lot of stuff, fancy cars, big house, and they're miserable because they, you know, maybe that's not what my self-worth is all about. Here's another example that uh, <clears throat> you'll love this one. Suppose I believe that men are better than women, okay? And I go to work and my new boss is a woman. Have I got a problem? <laughs> Absolutely. Has she got a problem? Short term, trust me, it's a short term problem. For <laughs> so the whole idea behind the belief window is, are the principles and beliefs on my belief window true? How will I know that they're not? Well, the behavior that is driven by those beliefs will work or it won't. And so the question I have to ask is the results of my behavior, are the results of my behavior meeting my needs over time? And if the answer is no, that means I have a bad belief or an incorrect belief on my belief window. And this simple model, we call it the belief model, this simple model helps people challenge their beliefs and ask the question, you know, if I believe this and it drives this behavior, is that behavior going to work for me? And if it doesn't, then we do surgery on our belief window. And this can work uh, by holding us back as well, right? I mean, there, we can have li limiting beliefs that we, we don't think we're capable of something, as an example. Absolutely. If I, if I believe in my mind that I can't do math and I'm a junior in high school, I'm not going to do well in math. And then that's just, and, and that's very likely a, of course, that was true in my case. I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, we, we, our behavior is driven by our beliefs, our good behavior and our bad behavior. And the issue is, you know, it changes the, the whole conversation. Instead of attacking behavior, I start asking the question, well, what are the beliefs on my belief window that made me do that? And the minute I start doing that, and, and that, and you, when you get into the time gap and the value gap, you know, what I believe on my belief window has a whole lot to do with how I manage my time and how, what I do with my, my value system. Well, that's, that's a great setup. So, so the second gap, you, you know, you call it the values gap when, when people realize that, you know, where, where I'm spending my time and energy is actually different maybe than, than where I want to be spending it. So tell me more about the values gap. The question that comes out of the values gap is, is there a gap between what I value, what matters most to me, and what I'm actually doing? And if there's a gap here, and this is a, this is a big one, I have to tell you, if there's a gap here, I'm in pain. For example, suppose I value being physically fit, but I weigh 350 pounds, I'm in pain. Why am I in pain? Well, there's a whole lot of reasons why I'm in pain, but one of the biggest one of the biggest reasons I'm in pain is because what I'm doing isn't in line with what I have decided matters most to me. Suppose I value being financially okay, and I'm half a million dollars in debt. I'm in pain. Well, how do I experience this inner peace, this this self assured okayness? I've got to close that gap. So I've got to bring what I do in line with that value. And the blueprint that we've discovered here is really quite simple. I'll just go flash through this for you. But what we ask people to do is to write their own personal constitution. And there are three simple steps. Number one, identify what your governing values are, write them down. Two, write a statement describing what they mean to you. And then number three, prioritize the values. This is not rocket science, nor is it easy. It's simple, but not easy. And so the whole issue is, and one of the things I try to do, I take people through an experience I call the I-beam, and I put an I-beam over the Grand Canyon. It's four inches wide, and it's 1,100 feet straight down. 
and I, I find someone who's got a child under the age of two, and I, and I say, would you come across this I-beam for $1,000? Are you kidding? No. Would you come for 2000 No. 10000 No. I have your two-year-old by the hair over the edge of this. Would you come for your two-year-old? Dang right I would. Now we just discovered one of their governing values, and that value is I, I love my child. Safety has value. Free, you know, money has value. But... I think I'd risk the I-beam for the child. And so the question that I ask people to write down and, and tattoo on their right thigh is what would I cross an I-beam for? And the answer to that question comes out at what my values do. And so, you know, do I really value my family? Do I really value integrity? Do I really value physical wellness? Do I value education? And then the, the issue, well, if I value that, what am I doing about it? And that's how this personal constitution, when I've written my, identified my values, and they, that, those three steps bring you into this wonderful personal constitution. And we built a nation on this. That's what our founding fathers did in 1787. They sat in a meeting in Philadelphia, where you are right now. Right, right. <laughs> and they yelled and screamed at each other for four months. And <laughs> they basically said to each other, what, what do we cross an eye beam for? They just crossed a hellacious eye beam, the Revolutionary War. Principles, values, ideas came up like the freedom of speech and religion and all the rest of it. And then they, they wrote a paragraph describing what those meant, and that became our Constitution. And so when no law is ratified in this nation until it's measured against our set of values for consistency. Why not manage your life like that? The values gap. You close the values gap, and I will tell you, it's, a, it's an unbelievable experience. It's a fabulous I, Control of one's life happens when you write your own constitution. So, Hiram, I'm curious, how much, like even in your own life uh, over the years, have your values changed? Have you changed or updated your personal constitution? Yes. Every year I update my personal constitution. Uh, what I have discovered personally is that uh, I haven't dropped any values, but I add them. I've added them. I started out with four or five. I now have 16. The number of them isn't important, but what is important is, is it what I really value or is it what somebody else thinks I ought to value? So that's really, really critical. The values don't change, but what does change is the written description of them. As we grow and mature, when we discover, you know, it, the whole idea of integrity grows and the paragraph grows and it means more to us. The whole idea of physical wellness, when I first wrote my physical wellness thing, it just had something about how much I weighed, you right, know, right. and now it's got all kinds of stuff in it about my cardiovascular wellness and what I eat. And your constitution does change. You amend it, but the basic values don't change. And listeners, I just want to underscore that. Like that, that really was an important distinction that I just heard. So <laughs> it's one thing and a great thing to have identified your value in whatever area, but how does fulfilling that value, what, what's your definition of that? And I, Hiram, I often talk about my three to thrive, which is health, wealth, and relationships. But that's the easy part. It's always reflecting on what, you know, great, great health means, what great relationships mean. So that's probably the harder part of it that, that goes on and on. Oh, absolutely. And those are three wonderful values. And I will tell you that most human beings probably share those three values you, you just described. But, but if I really sit down and put in writing what those values are, what they mean to me, the likelihood of my doing something about them goes up dramatically. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the actual process of writing that constitution is, is amazing. So the third gap that I wanted to talk to you about, well, you had an interesting thing in, in the book. You, you actually quote... Edwin Bliss, who wrote a book called Getting Things Done. And in, in that book, uh, Edwin Bliss says, the more time we spend on planning a project, the less total time is required for it. You know, emphasis on putting that time in up front, you know, uh, as an introduction to the time gap. And I didn't realize everybody uh, knows the book Getting Things Done from David Allen, but Edwin Bliss's book, Getting Things Done, was, I think, a decade before the David Allen book, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, this, you know what's interesting is that the time management books that have been written over time, if you go back and look at the 20 top time management books in the last 100 years, 
the basic principles in each book haven't changed one iota. Yeah. How we implement them has changed. The tools with which we implement them has changed. But the basic principles have not changed. But, you know, when we come to the time gap, here's the question you have to answer in the time gap. Is there a gap between what I did today and what I said I'd do today? <laughs> okay. And if there's a gap there, then I have a problem. So what's the blueprint for, for closing that gap? And, you know, if there's one simple idea that has the biggest impact on my personal productivity is the concept of and a commitment to taking 10 to 15 minutes every single day and planning my day. Now, that sounds simple. It's like, oh, yeah, well, everybody does that baloney. No, 92% no, of the American executives in this country do not do that. When you ask them, why don't you? And you know what they say? <laughs> I don't have time. <laughs> and I say, are you kidding me? And all kinds of studies have been done about that. A project that's going to take three hours, if you spend an extra 30 minutes planning, you can cut an hour off the execution of that project. Mm -hmm. Happens every single day. So if, if there's one thing I would ask people to do, you know what, morning or night, whatever it is, you find a place to be alone and decide what matters most for you the next day or that day. Well, th this is really powerful. And Hiram, I'm sort of known for being a, a curmudgeon. I actually say, you know, get rid of the to-do list entirely and just live from your calendar. If you want to do it, put it on your calendar. And this idea of just planning the day and then working from that plan rather than, oh, I've got 13 minutes here. Let me look at my to-do list. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to be doing it on the fly in that manner. Yeah, what you, the problem is, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, I play, if I if I plan my day, uh, then then I won't have any flexibility." What happens is, when you plan your day, you have now given yourself a shield against the unexpected. Now, what's the unexpected? That's the interruption. Now, you know what an interruption is. This is when somebody comes into your office under the mistaken belief that you care. <laughs> and the issue is, how do I get that person out of my office? <laughs> but the whole idea is the unexpected is going to happen. Interruptions are going to happen. But if I don't have a plan and an interruption comes up, I'll always go to the interruption. But if I have a plan, I can ask myself a question. Which has the greatest value to me right now? The interruption, the unexpected, or my plan? And I will tell you the impact that has is is remarkable as well because that quite often the unexpected will trump the plan i understand that but it's a conscious decision it's, it's a proactive decision not a reactive decision and most people spend their lives reactive every day they hit their office they turn on their computer you got mail and i'm screwed the rest of the day <laughs> but maybe in my plan i set apart 80 minutes to do emails and that's it and if you know and i'm going to take care of those and then i got other stuff i'm going to do and I tell you, you take control of your life like that. When you have a plan, you develop an unbelievable power to say no. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. And even that point where too many people are checking email rather than processing email. And so to schedule time, just like anything else, can contain that. Yep, absolutely. So, Hiram, before we wrap up, I always like to challenge our listeners to get 1% better each and every day. So is there something specific that you can challenge us to, to try out today? Absolutely. I, I would go right to that 10 to 15 minutes committed planning every single day. If people did that for 45 days, 10 to 15 minutes isolated, this is not shower time, this is not travel time, this is isolated time with myself uh, deciding what I'm going to do today and the sequence in which I'm going to do it today, people would be absolutely stunned. And they, and not only would they be stunned, but they'd intimidate everybody in their office. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bonus. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I love it. They hate you. They hate you. <laughs> so, Hiram, what's the best way our listeners can find out more about uh, you and your work? Well, you know, the, we have a wonderful website, 3gaps.com. It's the number 3, gaps, G-A-P-S dot com. Uh, I have a personal website, HiramWSmith.com, and uh, you know, the, and the book, they can, the Three Gaps book is on Amazon. They can get that through Amazon. It's an e-book, and that's the best way. And we'll put all of those links uh, with the show notes uh, from this interview up over at LeadX.org. So friends, you've just been mentored by the legendary Hiram Smith, universal principles that are more 
valuable today than I think ever before. Again, all the notes will be up uh, at leadx.org. You can get Hiram's book, The Three Gaps, from Amazon.com or your favorite bookstore. And listeners, if you learned one new thing, if you got one new idea from today's show, I hope you'll hop on up to iTunes and just leave a short, honest review. Those reviews mean a lot to us. And so until next time, remember, leadership isn't about a title or power or authority. It's about influence. And you influence people when you speak and you influence people if you choose to stay silent. We are influencing all of the time. We are all leaders. The question is, who are you going to lead today? 